Hey everybody, it's time for another Rant and Wade podcast. Uh, I'm just getting everything set up here. I, I could have done this earlier. Yeah, I could have, but I'm going to do it right now. Look at I don't even have the glasses on yet. You put the sound effects on as the, oh, the rose-colored glasses go on. With my funky nose, it's been busted too many times. Um, What's up, everyone? Uh, another episode, Rant and Wade, episode three. Holy crap, just kicking these things out every week. Said I would do it. And uh, I'm committing to it, um, which is something that I do. Not always, but uh, in this case, I do. Rant and Wade, it's just me talking to myself, talking by myself. Wade McElwain here. Uh, you will see, uh, oh, I got to move over a bit just in case, because sometimes I got to put my images of my uh, my little AI art. I put that up there sometimes uh, just for fun, just so uh, everyone could see some art. Uh, some of the stuff I'm working on gives me a chance. Oh, I move over a bit. There we go. <laughs> See, it's uh, it's a work in progress podcast. Uh, as I touch whatever is left in my hair, so I uh, podcast this week. Two things I'm going to talk about. Two big things. Um, you know, uh, things because I'm sort of been talking about sort of uh, is it end of the world crap? Is it a little bit? But I think they're more key uh, key moments, key uh, topics that we need to to touch on in life. This one is going to be uh, media. I'm going to talk about the media a lot, and I'm also going to talk about diversity. Um, couple of things. What should I start with? Probably the media. Yeah, I'm gonna start in the media. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lemonade, which also when I first moved to England, um, they call lemonade it's Sprite or Seven Up. So I remember going to a restaurant and getting it. I was like, "Can I have a lemonade? Ooh, it sounds lovely." And they bring me a glass of Sprite, and I was like, "You're horrible. This is not something we do." Oh my God. Sorry. One sec. Um, media. Let's talk about the media for a second. So. I uh, have a background in the media. I work in the media. I've been working in the media for uh, 20 years or so. Um, I come on a farm in Canada, and when I first watched television, I was like, this is magic, particularly when we saw American shows, because we normally got Canadian shows, and you're like, you could just tell it was Canadian. But American shows, I was like, this is something good. This is something great. I'm going to be a part of this. Um, so I was just fascinated by the business of television, how to get involved in television, how to get involved in media. I remember even calling in, like, and they were like, oh, we want people for shows. So I would call in uh, when I was like seven, eight years old. I'm like, I want to be on TV. And I got onto this treehouse club when I was like, gosh, eight years old. It was a kid's show in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. And then um, it's one of those things that I was, you know, my family, not religious. Uh, my parents baptized us all different religions, said, we'll take you if you want to go to church. None of us did. So. I'm on this show, and I'm like, I think this is religious. Because they just kept talking about God. And uh, most kids' shows not, unless uh, you're playing David and Goliath. That kind of crap. So anyway, uh, I, I was wanted to be on TV as a result. My, I, I got booked myself back in the next time, because my dad said we had a three-legged goat. It, we didn't have a three-legged goat. We had a goat that was game in one leg, uh, because they'd put elastics on his testicles. And then it made him game. Anyway, got on TV. So I was always fascinated by getting into media. And so I started getting into stand-up comedy, obviously. Good way to get into media, um, although they just treat you like crap. Comedians and comedy is not considered part of the media. It's not considered part of the arts. It's not considered part of anything. It's too vulgar for those in the arts. Um, and it's too popular for many of the other arts compared to, like, ballet. Um, so uh, anyway... So I uh, get into the media in Canada. Now, this is in the 90s. And in the 90s, media, you know, there, they had, there was, it was open for ideas. You know, you, you could take ideas, you could talk, you could pitch ideas. But as a comedian, I could, I could pitch ideas. And they actually came to me and, and pitched ideas. And you, you get that to some degree here in Britain. Now, Britain is a whole different entity when it comes to media. And I've lived in Britain for almost 20 years. Now, uh, we'll get into diversity because diversity I'm going to talk about in a bit. But if you look at diversity, so 70% plus of the media here in the UK uh, went to public school, which means they're rich, uh, private school kids. They do not let anyone else in. And in fact, they say absolutely horrendous stuff to you. I have never been more racially mistreated by anyone on the planet than posh people. Uh, and they say it like like you're like sitting beside Prince uh, Philip at a dinner party where I've had it. It's like, oh, Canadians are just retarded Americans. And I was like, you, you freaking kidding me, man? 
Like I was, and, and, and I would literally want to punch this person for dropping the R word, hard R, but also like slight in Canada. And they just didn't think it was anything he did was wrong. You have to understand that these people too, they fail up. And so they, most of them, one, didn't even watch TV or have a love for TV. They just want to be in the arts. And Tally's famous and they know someone and blah, blah, blah. So what you get and what you've seen here in Britain in particular is we have not had good shows. And we have, I'm going to say we have not had very good shows around the world in terms of non-scripted garbage shows. Um, Canada, same thing. America, a little bit better. Because the top, it's very difficult to get in. Here in the UK, if you may not know, it's like a lot of times you're like, oh, I see the same comedian on every show. That's because the way it works is here is they're like the, the, the production companies and the, and the talent agencies are like a super indie. So what they do is they sign. And I've, I've been a part of this process. I'm going to tell you this is actually really horrible. I was instructed pretty much to find young people that had five minutes of material and we were going to burn and turn them out. So that means that the production company and the talent companies don't really care about these comedians. They just want to exploit them, get as much out of them as they can, put them everywhere they can. And if they burn out, they will because they're going to be – the talent agency is not going to keep you when you get to 40 anyway. Their whole plan is to get rid of you by 35. Scary, huh? So what happens is is that there's all this clusterfuck of how TV shows get made. Um the, it used to be that you could pitch to a network, and I, I, when I first moved here, I could pitch to BBC ITV. That is not possible anymore. You cannot pitch to anyone. They won't hear your ideas. You could have the greatest game show in the world, and no one will listen to it. You could have the greatest scripted show in the world, and no one will listen to it. And in fact, they'll actually make you feel bad about doing it. <laughs> it just is even worse. It's like, why are you contacting us? Why are you doing this? Um, and that's part of the, this posh, super indie kind of thing that... There was some independent production companies that were running uh, television and film and things like that. And then what happened is they'd get a commission, they'd do well, and they'd just get bought by a super indie. These super indies are multinational companies, parts of Endemol, parts of big companies uh, that you'll find. And they just won't absorb you in, which we see a lot of that, the sort of Wall Street vacation. But it's not really good for media because as a result of it, they take the IP, take a lot of shows with it. And then you have a result of it crap shows because let's be honest the people who make television are not very good at it I, I and i'm i don't care i don't give a crap about the broadcasters out there i know you're idiots i know most of you are idiots um and they don't want to fail which is a horrible thing because in television you need to fail you need to try some things as opposed to just doing the same old crap what i notice here and what you'll notice here in the in the tv is in britain particularly once we got into the reality tv it was like everyone lost the energy and the will to create new formats. I was like, let's just put reality. And then what they decided to do is put these reality TV stars as presenters on other shows. So you have someone who literally, you know, didn't finish high school, you know, doesn't have any love or history for the media or training. You know, the, the thing about comedians or actors or musicians is they do. They go and perform. They perform for people live. And so when you come and perform on television, there you have experience, you have a bit of a cadence, um, and you don't get that uh, with a lot of these talent people. And they also get washed up and burnt out really quickly because the problem is you get used and abused a lot. Uh, in the UK, in the media here, you get used and abused. And it's just to a point, as I said, the industry is fine with burning these people out and just taking from them what they can. So, I mean, and also you wonder why, okay, so why is the media suck? Why is it so bad? Well, you probably know there's only like six companies that own everything in the media. You've got Comcast, you have Disney, you have Viacom, you have Fox, you have Sony, you have AT&T in the States, and that's pretty much it. Fox, of course, uh, you know, 90% of the media is controlled. 90% of all media is controlled by these six companies and 70% of all cable by these companies. Why is that a problem? Well, perspective, you know. The news, uh, when you wonder why people are fighting and you and we only hear so much of the same old news at 6 o'clock, it's because these six companies only want to tell you what they want you to know. You, you think they're going to bring up alternative news? And so when you hear about people and conspiracy theorists, well, is if you don't belong to this 90%, are you really conspiracy theorists? Because if you're not towing the line of these big corporate media companies... 
Comcast did 116 billion in revenue last year in 2021. Disney 67, so cable's still doing well. When you look at newspapers, again, 50% are owned by three companies: uh, Gannon, McClatchy, and the Tribune Publishing. So where's diversity? <laughs> you know, is this not worrisome? And I think when it comes down to looking at the media and looking at the problems of the media, the problem is that the government allowed the media to get bought up. It's all. There's no one else's fault but the government in this. The government should never have allowed this. And in Canada, they've sort of allowed it to happen, too. I mean, you've got, you look at, so Just for Laughs, comedy festival, gone bankrupt. Now, Just for Laughs had lots of assets. It had the TV shows. It had the gags and everything. And it doesn't own any, it doesn't own any brick and mortar. There are no physical costs. So why does it go bankrupt? Greed. People basically flushed that company the comedians never got paid for it. Canadian comedians, we were treated like second-class citizens. Americans were treated better than us. But, and you sort of go, well, how did, how did you waste, where did all the money go? And it was just, you know, people stuffing people, people stuff in their pockets. That's all it is. The greed, 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 that you see a lot of it. Uh, in Canada, the same thing. You have greed. You have Chorus Entertainment, which has Nelvana. Big animation studio does animation. Why would that go broke? It's gone broke. They've got to sell it. Because most of these people... And these companies are trying to run them like shareholder companies, and you just can't. You can't run the arts like this. The arts is not Wall Street. And people trying to treat these companies like this are dumb because the ebbs and flows of the arts, you can have a great show, and it may not be a few more years before you have another one. The UK news, let's talk about this. 90% uh, is owned by three companies. All right, UK news, uh, News UK, DMG, and Reach Media, 90% of all media. Uh, 80% of all line. When it comes to radio stations, Bauer and Global Radio own 70% of all the radio market here. 60% of the internet radio. So when you look at Bauer and Global, who are both kind of crap companies anyway, who just shove all this audio crap in our face, there's no real impetus for them to want to get better because there's no competition. They bought all the competition. And this is a problem. This is a worrying trend because it used to be the media, you know, at least in the 90s, cable. Someone would have put out something on cable and you're like, oh, my God, we want that. How do we do that? How do we get that? How do we get Robot Wars? Um, and people would just make up their own stuff. Um, you know, Survivor, which now everyone's ripped off and alone, uh, people have ripped off as well. This is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. And what you're going to see is more violence as a result of which because... There's also a difficulty in what becomes truth. You know, we can use AI and we can use Google and try to find what is truth, what is the truth. Um, but when the media used to entertain and educate us, if it's only coming from the same source all the time, well, how do you trust it? How do you how do you believe that anything there that they have has has any um, you know? That there, that there's there's depth to it. Sorry, I'm just losing my words here. I'm just getting upset at the media. Because you sort of look at it and go, how, how do I trust anything that you say? How do I trust the BBC? Uh, I, I, again, have worked for the BBC. The BBC is one of the most racist countries country, companies I have ever worked for. Um, and again, when you talk about Prince Philip, like when I've, I've worked at the BBC, they've taken me on tours, the old White City building, where, oh, this is Jimmy Savile's room, and everyone would do coke here. And you're like, oh, okay. Um but I was basically told, as a Canadian, uh, we have enough of you. We don't need any more of you. Um, and I was told bluntly by the head of comedy at the BBC, you're just the wrong color immigrant. And they just say it. Like, that's just the way it is. And you're like, I don't think you can say hate crimes. And it's just, the, the problem is also in there is that the BBC is very racist. And they're the first ones to go, oh, no, we're not. We're inclusive. They're not inclusive. You ever try to apply for a job there? What color were you? What color do you identify with? Um, what Do you have a sexuality? Tell us about your disabilities. How poor were your parents? Now, first off, you can't ask people. So I, don't, I just like prefer not to say these questions, but it is so invasive. Um, and it's there just for them to, to whittle their way through. Now, look, I'm going to get into diversity because diversity is an important thing. I, and diversity is good. Diversity should happen, but we've been doing this for 20 years now. You know, diversity started when I first started working. We're like, hey, we need more people, and you know, it was the end of the time of the white males. I would say that media is over-diverse. You, know, you go to certain places, you're like, 
oh, okay, I don't see you or you or you or you. Um, and, and so I would say that in terms of there's such this over diversity that the one thing that we don't have, which I'll get in, is people over 40. So people over 40 are, th are thought to be dead. Like even though you're finally getting stuff together, the industry, even though the industry is in their 50s and 60s, they don't want anyone. And it comes down to intelligence and challenging them. They don't want you because a lot of times they use this as a position of power to hold you down. And it's basically saying, I have this. You're not going to say, don't say no to me. And when you have enough power to go, you know what, man, don't do that. You're actually taking advantage of me. <gasps> they don't like that. Um, so age does not include, um, and the big thing being class, as I mentioned earlier, that class, if you come from a lower class, and, and you can see this, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is going on in, in Edinburgh now. And you see it in comedy. The posh kids, the people that came from money, uh, went to public school. They can afford to do comedy and have no job. Whereas if you're a comedian trying to live in London, one of the most expensive cities in the world, and you're trying to make it as a comedian, you better have three jobs, you know? And as a result of which, the people that review them and the people that commission are all posh. So they're like, oh, you went to school. So it's, you go into these meetings, they don't even care about you. You do not even exist. You are not, you didn't go to the same schools as them. They don't know you. And they all look down at you like you're trying to take away their telly even though they have not made anything good, like nothing good. Name me some good British shows in the past couple of years that have been innovative, that they haven't taken from someone's performance in Edinburgh or haven't been taken from someone else. Go ahead, you can't. So let's, you know, Canada, same thing. Canada is even you know, worse when it comes to diversity. We only have two companies. You have Rogers and Bell. Uh, the star system there is, is non-existent. And though Canada is able to export quite a few shows, there's never been any support for the arts, either from... CTV and and CBC and Rogers are do not care, do not care. <laughs> they don't care. Um, they would only care. And the only thing people care in Canada is if an American comes in or someone talks about Canada. That's all we care about. Oh, also the other thing in media: lots of pedophiles. <laughs> lots of pedophiles. There are, and I I'm not gonna say their names, but there are people, and I know that are pedophiles, and people that we know in the industry are pedophiles. But the industry will not say anything about it. Now, one is a duo and a comedy group, a few other comedians that I know, that if you asked anyone, would you leave your kids alone? Not a, not a chance. N anyone under 16, you would not leave this person in a room with them. In fact, you watch at parties, and I've, I've been at parties with these people, and people go out of their way to make sure that this pedophile does not get close. Everyone's all great because this person's powerful. But the, the powers that be, and you sort of go, oh my gosh, Hugh Edwards was a pedophile? Yeah, yeah, he was. They know it. They totally know it. They're not going to do anything because, again, nobody wants to take risks. So why would they want to lose their job by saying this guy's a pedophile? The pedophile still has power. And the pedophile, you know, like anyone who's locked themselves in a power entrenched, is going to find ways and stuff on. They're going to Epstein people. Very difficult to get rid of. So the fact is, yeah. There's lots of pedophiles, which uh, does not fit into diversity. It does, but uh, do we need do we need the diversity of the pedophile? I, I say no. I say no. Uh, I'm going to take a little sip of the lemster. Mm. So what diversity? Now, look, I'm all, I think diversity is great. There was a long time as a white male. A bit of mix in me. But uh, we had it good for a long time. Now, I wasn't privy to those times. I sort of, the gap between that. But I was like, oh, I could see it. And, and diversity definitely needed because there was a lot of things that needed to be addressed. There was a lot of systemic pro problems in, in industries. Um, and, you know, I, I could see it for women. There was a lot of things that we needed to do, people of color. But we've continued on with this diversity train. Um, and it becomes a little dangerous because once we start pushing a bit more diversity and you start affecting population. Now... Like anything, I, I always look to look at the mass of it all. How do the mass work out? Because at some point when you see, you know, because that's what part of diversity is, and a diversity and equality is all about trying to find that balance. If, if we have X amount of jobs and such amount of workplace, and, and it's great. Look, you have to understand, too, that diversity is great because there are populations that suddenly can be wealthy, that women of a certain demographic and a certain ethnicity will suddenly have jobs and this and this is, has resounding factors we know this the problem being is that when we when we negate and neglect 
the fact, actual numbers. Now, it's one thing to say, oh, there's too many white males, too many white males, too many white males. Well, how many, what percentage of the population is white? Well, you got to ask yourself that, right? Because if we've got too many, is it being proportionate? Because there is a degree of being proportionate, because sometimes if you have diversity, you can be unproportionate, you know? That if you have certain cultures represented two or three to one, you're not really reflecting the voices. In fact, you're actually pushing things in a bit different direction. So when you actually look at percentage of white population, 81.7% in Britain of white people. So what does that mean? 81%? That's a lot of people. Now, the big thing, a part about diversity is, and it goes back to my thing on intelligence, is that there a lot, most people, white people will be like, oh, it's all good. You know what? We did have it a good for a while. But then when you see the protest, there's a small percentage that are not. And they take everything personally and and they look at, and I don't think they look at the mass. I think they just look at other colors and hatred. But what you do is you radicalize these people. And these, and I've seen it because I've done comedy shows where you're like, what, what is this group for? Oh, you're white, this kind of stuff. Yeah, I uh, did not do the gig. But um, when you start seeing that people are seeing that the skew and the numbers being misrepresented, the angry. If you look at Asian, or as we would say, in Britain, Asia, because we would call them Orient, it's different. It's, you say diversity, now I'm probably saying things that are racist. I don't hope not. But we call them Oriental, which doesn't seems racist to call them that because the Orient is an outdated thing. But they still call them that in parts of Canada. In, in Asia, I'm going to say people from Asia because it, it does Asia, but then you can't, India is different than than China and South Korea and, and everything like that. But 9.3% of the population, 9.3, okay, 1 in 10. Um, black, 4.7%, mixed, 2.9%. So when you start looking at, yes, it's mostly a white country, or, and, and I live in London, and look, I love diversity. I love the smell of foods. I love just everything. I love it makes us all better. And I can say that because I'm an immigrant. Don't tell anyone. <coughs> oh, man. I did whispering. <coughs> Jesus, Louises. I do one thing of the whisper. Screws up my voice. Um, so, uh, yeah, just the voice and, and getting it. Um, 70% of companies um, have say that they have diversity hiring and that they're full and diverse. I don't know about the other 30%. And... The whole thing about diversity, though, that it needs inclusion because our current definition of diversity does not include age. Okay, so when we start talking about it, I'm over 40 um, and you get discriminated. You will, anyone who's over 40 will know that you do not get treated equally amongst other people. It's always, oh, we want the best 30 under 30. And when it comes to hiring or looking at people, they're like, oh, no, you must. And there, there comes down to preconceptions that they have or just being dicks, just being... Um, Class, again, another one as well. Um, and then li lived experience, I would say, is another thing. Because a lot of times, too, there's you live a lot. And someone can be really diverse by having been through a lot of stuff. Uh, and that's not included in diversity. Um, where I sit, if I have a conversation with someone and I explain, oh, I've traveled and done blah, 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 blah. People get offended. It's like, that's, and you're like, well, that's, I'm just part of my diversity. What about populations? We talk about age. Let's talk about age, particularly in the UK. And I tell you that over 40s are discriminated against. They are. Well, how, what percentage of the population do you think is over 40 in the UK? 50.7% are over 40. Now this is, and this is being discriminated by people within that own demographic, right? There are people that are in their 50s and 60s discriminated against people in their 50s and 60s. While well, the government's like, oh, we need people over 50. Once you get over 40, you disappear. It doesn't matter. They start looking at your CV and go, oh, it's too much experience. Part of it because part of the job industry and part of working is burning you out. Uh, and if you're younger, you're less likely to complain. Now, they want to grind as many years out of you as possible. But a lot of companies are attached to this idea, like the 50s, that someone's going to be an employee for life. No one's an employee for life anymore because people don't trust treat you like that. No one gives you enough respect to make you want to be an employee for life. So as a result of which, um, you know, uh, over 40s don't get as many jobs. Everyone's trying to push the youngers. And if you start looking the <clears throat> the under 25 demographic, 29.1%, which is fine, which is good. 
You know, it's it's still, you know, about one third of the population, but still half the population is over 40, which leaves us at 20.2% for the 35s to 49s. The plus 60s are 24.4%, and the 40s to 59s are 26.3%. The biggest group <clears throat> are the 40s to 59s. But why are, why are we not treating them equally? I'm in that group. So what, why is everyone in that group being discriminated against? Why is it, oh, you can't get a job. Oh, you can't do this. Dating apps don't work. When you start doing that and you start to find that that pushes, particularly with technology, it pushes people into loneliness. And so when people find in this diversity, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm not accepted or they don't want my kind. That is really difficult. <clears throat> in, diversity needs to, the main factor needs to be inclusion. That no matter what, that we can't say, oh, no, 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 our diversity doesn't include you. Anytime you do that, you're a fucking moron anyway. But <clears throat> diversity should be inclusive of everything. And we should be continue to keep up new things, aside from pedophiles. It's, there's no diversity. You might be in your own um, <clears throat> you know, little group, but no one really cares about it. So what do we do to it? What can we do? Wait, what can we do? Um, and, and what do you think is going to happen? <clears throat> well, let me go through. Other things going to happen in the media. Here, let me just go through the media now as I keep coughing up my shit. Mm. I think that we're starting to see a lot of these media companies like Netflix and everything have spent so much money. They're trying to catch up. It's like AI. AI is never going to make its money back. But what I think is going to happen is you're going to start to see some of them starting to collapse because none of them are really making money off anything. And they invested in all of this. They went through this whole woke <clears throat> thing where they decided, oh, everyone's going to be woke in their programming. And everyone adopted it. It became this whole de rigueur thing. It's like everyone, as the sort of South Park thing, put a chick in it and make her gay, you know. <clears throat> but when it came to it, everyone, and I think there was a lot of me, and it was like, as someone who appreciates diversity, just watching another show, it's like, oh, my God. Like, does everyone have to be from a different background? Do they all have to have their own struggles? There was this formulaic uh, cry for help that was sort of, they were trying to get this algorithm to try to uh, appeal to the young generation. And it was just, it shut off. There's so many shows you're like, really? And, and she's got her own love story. Oh my God. Like they, I thought this was supposed to be violent. And that's why you see the rise of sports across everything. Women's sports, men's sports. Every, people are just like, you know what? I don't want the doom and gloom. I don't want this crap. I just want to, I want to celebrate. I want to enjoy watching people do things. And, and that's a uh, part of diversity and part of media is, we just got to enjoy each other, man, um, because I think what's going to happen is I've been in the media for long enough that the big shows that sort of make money are the dramas or the one hour shows unscripted. We seem to went away from because there was just so much reality. There's so many putting tight bodied people on beaches and watching them hump, which works, I guess, for some things. But and so what you've seen now is people have gone to YouTube. And in fact, it used to be. All the producers, all the commissioners, whenever I talk to them, we want to get the kids. And I was like, why are you trying to get the under 15s? They don't care. They do not care about your show. And you shouldn't be chasing them anyway. You're wasting your time and money doing it. They're on YouTube. Why don't you just watch YouTube? And, and everyone has tried to replicate that, thinking that they're going to bring the younger generation back to television. They're not. They came back to for sports. But what you're finding now is that television commissioners have put out such garbage over the past few years. They don't take any risks. And so people are just turning it off. I mean, I watch more video game stuff. I watch more user-generated content now. And that's what you're going to start seeing. You're going to start seeing, I mean, that Mr. Beast <clears throat> made his own production company. I think, you know, you got Jake Paul and his brother boxing. What I think you're going to start seeing is that move from influencer to creating their own networks, almost like fast channels. Um, and what you're going to start seeing is the big industry is not going to be able to keep up. They're very bloated. Uh, they bought up everything, trying to keep up with everything. Um, and they're also trying not to pay the artists, which is going to come back to bite them because AI is going to go through a point where everyone's going to be like, oh, what have we done? We need actors. <clears throat> We're not at that point yet. It's Web 1.0. <clears throat> I got a tickly throat. Talking so much. <clears throat> um, so that's part of what I think is going to happen in, in the media. Um, and we're starting to see with war, obviously lots of wars, that things are going to get worse. Um, and war is going to be like sports. Um, it's going to be a, a sport that we all, as a spectator sport, we all watch um, because people are 
Yeah, end of the world now. We all sort of see it coming. Everyone's sort of angry and just sort of, uh, I'm just done with it now. Make it happen. So I think you're going to start seeing that in media. You're going to start seeing the attrition of people just sort of tired out from just the monotonous crap. Um, I mean, I look at Netflix. I watch it once a month. Like I literally flick on Netflix and I'm like, and I probably get rid of it because I'm like, what do I use this for? I don't even use it. I go on a Netflix and I'll flick through and, and the one I hate about Netflix, they have the worst directors. Like if you ever, if watch a good documentary, watch like a 30 for 30, like, or documentaries done by very good documentary filmmakers and then watch a Netflix documentary and it's just half assed. Um, so good documentaries come out. I think the other thing you're going to start seeing is local news will make a comeback. I think you're going to start seeing some entrepreneurs buying their old radio stations, buying AM radio because those radio stations work. And I think you're going to start seeing a revival, almost like a 90s style, guerrilla style revival of local news, local programming, community programming, because people miss that. Uh, that's one thing that's sort of happening is we're missing a sense of community. And as we get estranged from each other and as we find this whole world collapsing full of shit on us, we need a bit more community. So that's what I see happening. That's all I'm going to do for this episode, folks. Man, only a half hour banger. Not like the first one where I was throwing out 50 minutes, but I do have to go and do some other stuff. And you know what? I think 30 minutes is a lot for one man to talk to himself. If I did this in a pub, I would have lots of looks and I'd be asked to leave by about now and also mostly to stop filming. Folks, thanks for listening. This is Rant and Wade, episode three. Be diverse and uh, don't get a job in the media because there's no job.